So I'm Brian Kennedy. I'm a professor at the Buck Institute for Research on Aging and a visiting uh, professor at National University of Singapore. And I'm Linda Partridge, and I'm director at the Max Planck Institute for Biology of Aging in Cologne, Germany, and also director of the Institute for Healthy Aging at University College London. So, Brian, how did you get into aging research? Yeah, well, the funny thing was that when I went to graduate school, I'd worked in yeast as an undergraduate, and I decided that I was not going to work in yeast anymore. But the more I realized about how difficult it was to work in mice, the more I wanted to work in yeast. And so there was another graduate student and I that wanted to go to Lenny Garanti's lab. And uh, we decided to work in yeast and we wanted to figure out something completely crazy to do. And we had came up with two ideas. One was yeast apoptosis, which was a little weird for a single celled organism. And the other was aging. And we decided that aging was the you missed, least- You missed the Nobel Prize. <laughs> True. Um, we Make decided happen. that aging was the least implausible of the two, and so we did that. But there's a whole field on yeast apoptosis now, too, so I guess we would have been okay. How about yeah. you? Well, I got, got into it crab-wise, really, because I started out life as an evolutionary biologist. So from the evolution point of view, it's a completely weird trait because development produces a wonderfully functioning young organism and then it all goes to hell. You'd think it would be a lot easier to maintain it than to produce it in the first place. So I became very interested in how aging evolves and it is indeed really peculiar. It's it's almost certainly given what we've learned recently about the mechanisms of aging, actually bad effects in old age of genes that are good in the young. So I think that's pretty interesting if you think about it as genes driving the old organism too hard to do the kinds of things that young organisms can do very well. I think yeah. it makes it quite, quite an easier process to think about, put it that way. I've always found it a puzzle, and both of us have worked on this a lot, is you know we've been trying to show that uh, the pathways that are modulating aging are conserved. Uh, and it's always kind of a puzzle that there's so much conservation if this is a trait that evolution never really cared about that much. So uh, it's a... Uh, I've never quite set, got that satisfied in my mind. What do you think about that? I guess what I think is that the processes that you and other people have come up with are, are ones that, that do drive good things in young organisms. They're the things that make for growth, uh, for reproduction, for strong immune responses, for um, effective muscles and movement, all the things that young organisms have to do. But they seem to be set at too high a level when you get old. And I, I think that way it, it is actually quite easy to understand why it's evolutionarily conserved, because presumably the kinds of genes that control growth and reproduction evolve very early on. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I actually argue with people that uh, aging is going to be easier to modify than disease. And so I, I think it's going to be easier to keep people healthy than it is to wait till they get sick and try to treat them and make them better. Because I kind of think of it as very simplistically as a state of homeostasis versus disequilibrium. You know, while you're still relatively healthy, it's fairly easy to tap into these pathways, relatively easy to tap into these pathways and try to maintain that. But once you get into a state of disequilibrium, which I would call chronic disease of one sort or another, then you've got a problem. You're kind of uh, fighting entropy at that point and trying to get put things back together again is very difficult. Yes. It's very interesting talking to colleagues in other areas about that idea because one gets a kind of yuck response. So does that mean that humans are going to have to take pills when they're healthy to prevent disease? And you can point out that people do that already. I mean, statin yeah. and aspirin and things that lower high blood pressure, none of these are dealing with disease states. They're in anticipation of possible disease states and trying to prevent them. So there's plenty of taking pills to prevent things already, but for some reason, when you talk about it as a likely outcome of research into aging, there's quite often a kickback, even from other scientists. I think most of the things we take, you know, that are really working effectively really are aging drugs as much as they're disease drugs. It's, you mentioned aspirin, but not just that. I mean, look at um, statins, look at uh, beta blockers, look at um, diabetes, early diabetes drugs like metformin. All of them are targeting early risk factors for chronic disease. And I kind of feel like these risk factors are right at the interface between aging and disease itself. 
Yeah, they're right on the nexus of the way in which ageing actually is a risk factor for disease. And I think the other thing about them is that it's quite clear that they're turning out to have you know, off-licence effects. Most of these drugs have a much broader therapeutic range than they're generally used for, which is exactly what you'd expect if they're in there, in that nexus between ageing and disease. So what, what's what's exciting to you now in your research? Where, where, where are you going in the next five years? Well, funnily enough, very much into drugs. So we've been doing quite a lot of drug work with um, Drosophila and based exactly on this idea that you know, mechanisms of aging are conserved. We're starting to take a number of these drugs into mice, but also starting to do some uh, big database stuff with humans, looking at particular pathways that have come up in the model organisms and asking whether SNPs associated with those pathways in humans, ones that are either likely to increase the activity of the protein concerned or decrease it, are associated with particular types of disease risk. So one can do this process called Mendelian randomization, which uh, in theory gets rid of a lot of the effects of genetic background and, and focuses on a particular SNP. And now I think there's enough data coming in on humans that we can really start to do the population genetics on these pathways. And I'm terribly excited by that. What about you? Well, I have two, two goals right now. One is to try to go back to the simple organisms and really take a systems approach and try to take a yeast cell, for example, and be able to describe all of the features of aging, not just one gene at a time. And so we're working a lot in sort of systems biology approaches there. But I think the main goal I have is... Do you mean you're looking at gene combinations or how are you doing it? Yeah, gene combinations, but also working with our collaborators to look at how... Um, uh, signaling pathways change with age to start to really understand longitudinal processes in a yeast cell. So the idea is to combine that with the genetic data and, and try to put the puzzle together. Um, I think my, interesting. My, my main goal really is to uh, get human <laughs> and to start testing interventions in humans because I think we have enough knowledge now that we have things that are likely to work. And we have reasonable candidate biomarkers, none of which are completely validated, but I, I feel good about some of them. And if you put that together, you know, I, I kind of see it as a, a lock and key fit. You know, we've got a bunch of interventions, which are potential keys, and we've got a bunch of biomarkers, which are potential locks. And we have to figure out which keys fit in which locks. And so I'm looking at, you know, uh, strategies to really test that in humans, either through academic research or through private companies. So do you think companies are going to be interested in doing the kind of research that would target more than one disease? Or do you think the way in is going to be to go for particular disease states? How, how do you think we should do it operationally? I, I'd much rather target uh, healthy aging or health span or prevention of multiple diseases. And I think there are companies that are thinking about that now, but they're still relatively small generally. Uh, I, I think pharma kind of walks up to that ledge and looks over and then backs up. But eventually, I think that it's it's going to happen. And I think what we need is some evidence that we can really modulate aging pathways. And uh, that's where this biomarker strategy or the kinds of things that Mir Barzilai is doing to look at you know, multiple disease parameters simultaneously in clinical trials. Those kinds of things, I think, are... You just need a couple of success stories and then people will start to get it. Uh, yeah. So so I, I'm agnostic as to whether it's done academically or privately. I just want to make it happen. And so, I, you know. So what do you think about, I mean, we know so much from the animal studies about rapamycin now. We probably know more about that than any other drug in the context of aging. Do you think there are going to be more clinical trials with rapamycin for off-license applications? Yeah. Do you think there could be a trial for Alzheimer's, for instance? You know, there have been a lot of talk about trials for Alzheimer's, and I don't think one has gotten started yet. Uh, but I, I think you're going to start to see more and more of this. And then, of course, you know, there's there's a lot of research to try to figure out how to either dose uh, rapamycin or everlimus, which is the first generation that rapalog, in a way that doesn't have the toxicity or to develop new drugs uh, that have the efficacy without the toxicity. And so I think both of those approaches are moving forward. You know, Novartis just spun off a small company to try to do this. And, and so I think that, I think there's renewed interest in, in trying to inhibit it mTOR, but there's still um, a lot of open questions about how it's going to be best to do that. But having said that, the number of potential indications, I mean, 
not to mention aging itself, is so large that there's clearly value into doing this successfully. So I'm pretty excited about where that's going to go. I, I think that's only one of a bunch of pathways, though. And, and you know, and you're looking for new drugs and new pathways. And I think we're going to find that there are a lot of different potential entry points for intervention in aging as we go forward. Yeah. I think it's a time of great excitement. I just hope that some of the human trials get get done while I'm still active. I'd really, uh, I'd love to see some successes with people. I, I think that's- well, you'll be active for at least 20 more years. So I, I, I'm not worried about that. <laughs> Perhaps longer if somebody comes up with a pill. <laughs> yeah. So that, you know, that that's why I think doing this fusion conference has been so fun. You know, we've done two of these now in Cancun. Uh, and uh, the idea is to bring different groups of people to look at different strategies for interventions in aging. Uh, and uh, I think that the conferences are relatively small, but we try to recruit a wide range of people. So we get people discussing different kinds of ideas that don't normally talk. That's what I think the strength of it is. What, what do you think? I agree with that. I really like the format of those conferences because they have a, a low upper limit on the number of delegates deliberately. Um, so that most people can give talks or posters and there's plenty of time for discussion and what I noticed at those meetings correspondingly is that the discussion is very intense almost everybody talks to everybody else at some point during the meeting so there's a real interchange of ideas as you say between people who we deliberately invite from different areas and I think it's been a great success and it it's also been very nice to see it going more and more translational. There is more and more interest in mechanisms that are going to give rise to preventative measures rather than just the basic research, which has been fantastic and was necessary to get anywhere. But people really are trying to push it into helping people now. And I find that very exciting. So yes, yeah. I think the meetings are great. Yeah, I know. And I think as we go forward with these meetings, we'll probably continue to try to emphasize these human intervention studies as much as possible. Yeah. Is that, I, I, I think that's very much a speciality of that meeting. Yeah, because there are other meetings that really focus on the basic biology of aging, but this is really trying to get at the next step. Yeah. Yeah. It's particularly good when we can get basic scientists and clinicians together, I think, and also people from the various companies who might do something about the discoveries. I think it's yeah. a very good mix of people that way. Yeah, I, I can't, you know, in my better moments, I think that we're almost right at the tipping point where we're going to, you know, push over this wall and uh, then all of a sudden everybody's going to be saying, oh, targeting aging is common sense in 10 years. Um, I still have the bad moments where I feel like the little soldier walking into the wall and never going yes. anywhere too. <laughs> yes, I, I fluctuate between those two points of view as well, but I find myself feeling optimistic more and more often. Yeah. I yeah. seeing what's happening that's good well it'll be exciting to see where the field goes moving forward and, and yeah uh, indeed indeed yeah.